Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sparks Institute event. This is the Ian and Mildred Carton Memorial Lecture 2021, uh, organized with the Center for Medieval and Renaissance Culture. I am Claire Lefort. I am Associate Director, uh, Associate Professor of East European Jewish History and Culture at the University of Southampton and Director of the Parks Institute for the Study of Jewish Non-Jewish Relations. So the Parks Institute is an interdisciplinary institute, a community of scholars, activists, librarians, and students at the University of Southampton. It is named after the Reverend Dr. James Parks, who was ordained by the Church of England in 1926 and who spent all his life campaigning against the rise of racist nationalism and anti-Semitism. He helped rescue Jewish refugees during the 1930s. He campaigned for the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. And he also helped uh, founding the Council of Christian and Jews during the Second World War. Uh, so, the Parks Institute is furthering his legacy through academic research and public activities. It was established in 1964, or at least the Parks Library was donated to the University of Southampton in 1964. So I'm really pleased to see actually tonight uh, some uh, members of the Carton Trust, some Carton trustees, including Anthony Davis. We are very honored of your presence. And I will now uh, hand over to Sarah Pierce, who is a Ian Carton professor, who is a member of the Parks Institute, and who is also head of the School of Humanities and who will chair this lecture. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, welcome to everyone. Um, welcome to our visitors. Uh, to our colleagues and our distinguished speaker this evening, and of course to Anthony Davis as the nephew of the late Mildred Carton. Very warm welcome. Um, as Claire has already indicated, the success of the Parks Institute at Southampton reflects not only the commitment of our very dedicated staff and the support of the University of Southampton, but partnerships with a wide range of organizations outside Southampton. And at the very forefront of this has been the Carton Trust, founded by Ian Carton, who was a refugee from Nazism when he arrived in England. And as a young refugee who was able to come here in the late 1930s on a university studentship, what would become part of the University of London, Ian Carton had met James Parks at a garden party in James Parks's home in Cambridgeshire. This was no unusual event for James Parks. He dedicated himself to hospitality towards refugees during this period. And Ian Carton remained not only impressed by that chance to see what became of the Parks Library, but also by the generosity and kindness of James Parks as a person in putting the young Ian at ease in an alien environment. This was part of James Parks's wider work in helping refugees and especially young students and academics to escape from persecution. Ian, I remember saying that it was that scholarship that saved his life uh, in England. After a remarkable and successful career as an engineer, Ian devoted with his loyal and supportive wife, Mildred, his life in retirement to creating a trust to help those like himself who needed extra support through education to develop their careers. And since then, the Carton Trust has supported thousands of students across the world. It has also set up hundreds of centers in Britain and in Israel to help physically disabled people to develop themselves and make themselves ready for the world of work through the use of technology. At the University of Southampton, Ian Carton's generosity began with supporting our MA students on our Jewish history and culture program. It then extended to support a postdoctoral fellowship, first occupied by me um, as the first Carton Fellow, a, a, um, a position of which I, I'm very proud. That support and generosity expanded even further and has created four lectureships, including an outreach post uh, that was formerly occupied by Helen, or originally occupied by Helen Sperling. 
Indeed, outreach work in schools and colleges and adult education was at the very core of Ian's interests. And we're delighted that through the Carton Trust's generosity, we are able to connect with such a wide audience. Most recently, the Trust has supported our move to cultural and digital uh, education activity and the recruitment of a digital coordinator. The support given to us by the Carton Trust is now at a total of two million pounds. In 1998, in honour of his remarkable career and generosity, but also the care and interest that Ian had shown in the Parks Institute, the university awarded Ian an honorary doctorate. This was, as anyone who was there at the time, was one of the most moving events in the university's history. Uh, if I could just say, I remember it very well. Normally these are very official, silent events in which the individual is robed and sits down and Ian grabbed the microphone and spoke about his passion for Southampton and our work here and the audience of young students just graduated erupted with applause. Sadly we've lost both Ian and Mildred and I understand that Ian would have reached his hundredth year this year and as a way of remembering these two outstanding individuals we have the annual Ian and Mildred Carton Memorial Lecture. And it's my very great honor to introduce to you our, as I said, really very, very distinguished speaker, Professor Judith Olshevi Schlanger, Fellow of the British Academy. Judith is president of the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, a fellow of Corpus Christi, Oxford, and also professor of Hebrew manuscript studies at the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes, Paris. Her research interests include Hebrew paleography, Cairo Geniza studies, as well as Hebrew manuscripts from medieval England. Her publications include Karaite marriage documents from the Cairo Geniza, legal tradition and community life in medieval Egypt and Palestine, and Hebrew and Hebrew Latin documents from medieval England, a diplomatic and paleographical study. So one can only begin to imagine the variety of skills and languages uh, which she applies to this very important research. Judith's title for this evening is Jewish Scribes at Work in Medieval Egypt, Glimpses from the Cairo Geniza. So if I may pass now to our speaker to present her lecture. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for this kind and very important introduction. Thank you, Claire, for inviting me to Parks Institute. I'm really honored and uh, I'm really very happy to share with you this work, which, which is somehow the work I have been doing for a long time. But the nature of the Cairo Geniza and Hebrew manuscripts in general is to surprise us. So new discoveries happen all the time. And what I'm going to do today is to share just, just a few insights just a few ideas about how medieval people, medieval scribes made and read and produced, created their books and how the books function in this medieval society. To do so, I will share my screen and I hope that the Zoom will not let me down any moment of our discussions. It already did during the so I hope it will be fine now. As uh, if I can just right. say something. I hope that As Judith's uh, connection seems a bit low, could all participants please switch off their cameras? Yes, this is indeed a very, very good question. Right, I'm going to begin by a very famous man. Um, Isaac Ben Solomon Israeli, uh, born in Egypt and active in Cairo, the first half of the 10th century. In uh, his book, on fevers, chapter three, in the other very interesting things. Yes? Judith, sorry, your, your connection is not very good. Can, Can you, you hear me? 
Can you maybe switch off your, your video just to see if it makes the sound better? Sorry, it's, it's, it's a shame. <laughs> Or I will maybe. Are you still here? Sorry, I will try all kinds of. Is it better? Yes, <laughs> let's try. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So you can, yes, can you hear me now? A little bit. Okay. So I like this. It will take more space. I have started talking about this type. Hello, can you hear me? Not very well, actually. Oh, that's really, I really don't know what to do. I see you very well. I hear you very well. My computer is saying everything is fine. Now, now it seems to be good. So Right. So I have just switched to my phone. So I hope that my phone will hold. hold yes, <laughs> great. Okay, very good. So for the third time, I'm introducing to you this wonderful man, Isaac Ben Solomon Israeli, born in Egypt, but active in Tunisia in Cairo 1 at the first half of the 10th century. He was a famous physician, wrote a book, book on fevers. He wrote many books, but one of the most famous ones is book on fevers. And in the introduction to chapter three of this very important work, he says, the persistence in reading books and obstination to grasp their wisdom tires the soul, weakens the mind, and exposes the vital spirit to accidental fever. Well, you would not expect such a negative judgment about books about the from the author of so many different works on medicine of course but also on philosophy you would not expect him to echo the Kohelet, Kohelet 12 uh, there is no end of making many books and this very negative judgment about reading and uh, and writing uh, it is quite possible that in the 10th century he in a way reacts to the spread of literacy, but also, well, as we, when we speak about the Jewish people, literacy is something which has been acquired for a long time in the 10th century, in the medieval period. However, the 9th and the 10th century witness, not only among the Jews, but especially among the Arabs in the Islamic world, a real explosion of reading culture, of bibliophilia, I would like to say, we know about huge collections of books being formed not only by caliphs who, who also employed scribes to create the books, but also by private individuals. And famous Jewish um, physicians or leaders have also created libraries at that time. So it is possible that, that at, in, the, in the 10th century, the spread of reading worries some of the scholars because of the sheer number and interest in, book, in books that spread. Uh, books indeed, well, when we talk about Jewish books, of course we have to, we have to place ourselves in the, in the long tradition. Books are not new for the Jews in the Middle Ages. On the contrary, it is a continuity of an ancient tradition by the Middle Ages. The Jewish cult religion is centered around a book in particular, and the most the Bible, of course, and the most important um, uh, intellectual activities and social activities evolve around um, written books or learning from books by heart, like the, the learning of Talmud, which is known as Torah Shebe'al Peh, the oral law. But in the Middle Ages, it is transmitted from books, even if it is learned by heart. So books are central in Jewish, in Jewish culture, they have been central for many centuries already. However, under the influence of the, of the Arabic Adab culture and the developments in the world of, of Muslim and Arabic book in general, Jews approach the books differently. There are new literary genres that are being created. The author, which was not a recognized entity 
in the antique Judaism, where books were rather collective experience, sometimes considered as inspired, divinely inspired, or, or works of the prophets, suddenly begin to have named authors who have ideas, share these ideas, and try to, um, to preserve and control the transmission of their ideas. Books are read as well for leisure. They are written for leisure and, and read as well just for sheer pleasure. I have brought here quite a famous uh, example from, of, written by Samawal Yahya al-Maghribi in the 12th century. He was a physician, mathematician, and the son of Rabbi from Fez. He converted to Islam at the age of 33 and traveled to Central Asia. He even wrote a book of polemics against Judaism and Christianity. But he describes in one of his books, already as a Muslim, but he describes the experience of his childhood when he was still a Jewish boy in the Maghreb, in, in Morocco. He says, at the age of 12 or 13, a strong love for reading books and records from the past was awoken in my heart. I desired to know most of all what happened in early days and in the past centuries. I therefore read compilations of accounts and stories. From them, I passed to reading long entertaining stories and anthologies of tales and fables, such as the tales of the Antar, Alexander Romance, or Al-Anka, which is the Sphinx. So we have here a completely new approach to books in the medieval period, which makes the book central, not only for religion, but also for different professional activities and for sheer pleasure. When we talk about the books and this change of attitude towards the books by the 9th and 10th century, and of course, here we talk as well about the increase of the production in, in, in books. Um, of course, it happens and is very well documented in the Islamicate world, in, in the Arabic speaking world, but also among the Jews. So this bookish revolution of the 9th and 10th century uh, this real empire of writing, which happens at, at the medieval period, has a king. So the king of this empire, empire is a scribe, a scribe as a figure. Of course, we cannot imagine making books in the medieval period without a person who copies them by hand. That's why the scribe is absolutely central for many different reasons in the medieval book culture. And today I'm going to share with you some ideas about the scribes from a very particular angle, from the point of view of the books, fragments of the books that have been preserved in the so-called Cairo Geniza. First of all, I'd like to point out that, that the books that come from the Cairo Geniza are usually very small fragments. However, they are an amazing, amazing evidence of the, first of all, diversity of Jewish books in the Middle Ages. First of all, in the classical period of the Cairo Geniza, to which I'm going to come back in a moment, we have books which are written in Hebrew, but also in Arabic script, most of them by Jewish authors, but also we find in the Cairo Geniza books, like here we have fragment of Kalila Wadimna, you have the shelf mark from the Cairo Geniza collection uh, under, under each, um, each manuscript. So we have as well books that were simply read by people around, Arabic books read by the, by the Muslims, Christians, and Jews alike, because these were fables. This is what people read. So the Cairo Geniza gives us an enormous diversity of books. And also, it is just the most wonderful proof that doctors like like, like Israeli, have not been listened to. People, despite some negative opinions about the books and about what they can do to your bodily and mental health, continued producing and reading books in a very large numbers. The Cairo Geniza is an example of such an amazing amount of book productions. The Cairo Geniza, well, very briefly, because probably you have heard about the Cairo Geniza many, many times already, and probably several times this year with this Zoom 
Zoom uh, conferences which go, go, go ahead in all parts of the world. So first of all, I will just very briefly remind you that, that because of the sacred character of Hebrew writings, since the late antiquity, there exists in Judaism a specific um, institution, which is called a geniza, a hiding place or a burial place, a place in a synagogue. It can be a box, it can be a room, it can be an attic or a cellar, or it can be also a place in a cemetery where worn out books, which are not going to be used again, are stored. They are thrown away into this place, not to be, uh, not to be destroyed intentionally. They are thus protected from profanation, but not from destruction. They will disappear by natural means, but not by human intervention. Such a geniza was discovered progressively during the second half of the 19th century, first by book, book merchants, uh, antique dealers, and then scholars, such as Agnes Lewis and Margaret Gibson from Cambridge. They were not a mem members of the university because it was difficult at that time in, in, in Britain to, to, for a woman to, to be a university professor, but they were recognized le learned scholars, orientalists who traveled extensively to the East, acquired collections of manuscripts, and together with Solomon Schechter, their friend, made very important discovery um, of, a, um, of a Hebrew original of the book of Ben Sira, which until now was known only from its Greek uh, Septuagint translation. This prompted Schechter to travel to Egypt and to bring to Cambridge over 150,000 fragments um, of manuscripts, which were discovered in the Geniza. Um, a, a, a little bit less than the, than, than the double of that, I mean, well, exactly the same amount, uh, found its way to different uh, collections in the world. And today, across the world, in about 72 collections, we have over 350,000 fragments, which we need to realize that come from only one Jewish community. Of course, in the Cairo Geniza, there, is, uh, there are writings not only from Egypt, but also from Tunisia, North Africa, from Spain, from, from, the, from the Muslim um, Mashrek as well, going, going, uh, going up to the Central, Central Asia. However, the majority were produced in Egypt. And even if they were not produced in Egypt, at some point in the history, they were read by the Egyptian Jewish community. Until now, the, the full catalog of the Geniza collection does not exist. So we don't know how many we have among these 350,000 fragments. Uh, we know that 90% at least, rather than documents, so the large majority of the Geniza are books. And we estimate that there are about between 30,000 and 40,000 complete books when we put together different fragments and pieces of different, from different collections. So when you imagine one community, one Jewish community, it was an important community. The community of Egypt, of Cairo, of Fustat was an important community because Fustat was, an, uh, was not only Cairo's Fatimid capital, but Fustat was a very important commercial center. So it was an important community, but still just one Jewish community in the classical period, which goes from about um, 950 to 1250 and 40,000 books. This is an enormous mass of writing. And indeed we have evidence from the Fatimid period of Ibn Zafan, a Jewish doctor who amassed a library of over 20,000 volumes by himself. This is recorded by Ibn Usaybiyah in the 13th century, a, a famous author of an encyclopedia of Jewish, uh, encyclopedia of Egyptian physicians. Um, so the Cairo Geniza provides an amazing corpus on which we can work. Of course, this corpus can be complemented by other oriental collections. There are books which come from Egypt or other places in the, in the, in the East, in the Middle East, which have never been in the Cairo Geniza. There are as well books that have never been in the Cairo Geniza, but 
the manuscripts written by the same scribes were found in the Cairo Geniza. So we have books which were produced in the same milieu, but have never been thrown into the Cairo Geniza, but preserved in better circumstances. So we are going as well to use today a few examples from such books, which were not found in the Cairo Geniza, but belong to the same Geniza world. So 40, 30 to 40,000 books, which were written or read in Egypt in one specific community. So of course, the scribes, people who wrote them, are extremely important for our understanding of the medieval culture. So today we are going to ask a few questions. Some of these questions have been, been partly answered by Shlomo Dobkoitain, Colette Sirat, Malachi Betarie, or Miriam Frankel. And these questions are, who are the scribes in the world which is reflected in the Geniza fragments? Were they professionals? What, how they lived? Um, in what context they were, worked? How much did they earn? What was the economic foundation of their profession? In what contexts did they work? At home, in an office, in a school, in a synagogue, in a workshop? How did they learn their skills? Were there special schools for scribes, calligraphers? And what do they actually do? What, what is the work of the scribe? How does he work on creating a book? So first of all, who and how much? Virtually everyone could be a scribe or creator of a book or a document in the medieval world. Of course, male rather than female. There were women who learned how to read and write but the basic education was rather reserved to, for, for, for men. So we are, we are going to talk, to use the masculine pronoun, and I apologize for that because probably there were female scribes as well, but it's very difficult to, to, to talk about them because we have very, very few evidence of them. Very often the scribes were school teachers. They are called Hamelamed or Al Mualim or they were synagogue officials, Hazanim. There were as well artist calligraphers, freelance working for patrons who were usually paying bibliophiles. The wages were very low. It could be as low as one dirham a day. In order to, to, to talk about the prices of the books and the work of the scribe, I would like to refer to the works of Shlomo of Goitain, and I'm not going to go into any detail today about this particular aspect, the economic aspect of the books. I would like just to mention one wonderful example, which is a letter from the, um, from the Cairo Geniza, a letter which talks about the restoration of a codex in the 13th century. Uh, it is the story of a codex which is preserved in the synagogue of the, the Palestinians al Shamain in, um, in Fustat. And this codex is called the Brother, the Brother of the Crown, the Brother of the Taj, which we think was the famous Aleppo Codex. This codex was, was worn out and many pages could not be read. So a wealthy patron decided to finance the restoration of this codex and a letter concerns the details about the work. Um, an intermediary is looking for a scribe and tries to to find a scribe who will be able to undertake this work of restoration. Many scribes decline. They say it is so much easier to create a new being rather than resuscitate the, the dead. So at some point, the scribe is found and undertakes the restoration of 60 folios for a very low price, which is one dirham per folio. It gives us an idea about how much the scribe was paid. One dirham, it is um, these, these are wages of, a, of, a, of an unskilled laborer. So it is indeed a 
very low um, pay. What was the context of book production? Books could be, product, uh, could be made at home by anyone in a kind of do-it-yourself way. There are as well autographs in the Cairo Geniza, books copied by their authors. We have as well the role of scribes, secretaries of important writers. We have evidence of freelance professionals and the special category, the calligraphers. We have as well a work which these calligraphers do for paying patrons. There exist as well very precious books produced by calligraphers, which were dedicated by a private owner to a synagogue or a house of learning. There were as well scribes working from a workshop, from a professional of writing, which is called a warak. We are going to come back to it. There were as well scribes which specialized in drawing up legal documents in the court of law. Uh, this did not prevent them from copying books as well, not only documents, but books. And also in the period under consideration, it was very important for uh, some of the authors to control the quality of the books and text which was transmitted. Just a few examples that I am going to show of the books which were written by the scribes for their own uh, use, like this uh, copy of uh, Kitab al-Mustalhaq, the grammar book by Jonah ibn Janakh, which was copied in Aden in 1143 by Elazar ben Abraham ben Elisha, who says in Arabic, in Hebrew script, I wrote it in that it was written in his own handwriting and for himself, Linafsihi, for himself. So he wrote it for himself. We have as well in the Cairo Geniza drafts of autographs of very well-known writers. The most famous of those is, of course, Maimonides. More than 70 fragments of different autographs written by his own hand were preserved in the Cairo Geniza. We know as well that Maimonides worked with secretaries in such a way that some of the drafts of his books were written by himself, but we might as well find neat copies or first copies of the books which were created by people who worked for him. A very important manuscript to tell us about how the books, Maimonides' books in particular, were, were made is the manuscript in Gotha today, A 1937, which is a, 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 an Arabic copy, not at all Jewish, written by non-Jewish scribe in Arabic of Kitab al-Fusul Filatib, the aphorisms or chapters, medical chapters, of Moses Maimonides, based on Galen, about 1,500 1, different quotations from Galen with commentaries and elaboration by Maimonides. It contains 25 chapters, and the last chapter contains a colophon or a mention at the end, which says, ended the book of chapters, which were composed by our master Moshe, Ben Abdallah Ha Israeli Ha Kurdubi on medicine. I, the scribe of the Arabic manuscript, copied this composition from the very manuscript of Abul Ma'ani, Yosef Ben Abdallah, and he is the son of the sister of the aforementioned author. We know indeed that Maimonides has had a sister whose name is Miriam, and uh, a letter written by Miriam is actually preserved in the Cairo Geniza, she wrote to Maimonides. And I found written there, so the scribe of the Arabic manuscript Gotha found written in the copy he used to copy his manuscript, which belonged to a nephew of Maimonides. I copied the essay 25 after the death of my lord, the master, my uncle on my mother's side, before he had time to arrange it, as he did with the previous chapter because he used to compose a note in his own hand. And after that, I would make a clean copy and compose it in his presence. And this version of the chapter 25 was completed in the year Tafresh Vav, which is 1205. So a year after Maimonides' death. 
So we see that Maimonides worked with the help of a secretary. So the scribe could be attached to a specific person or institution to create the first neat version of the book, which will be the, the version which will be rendered public and people will copy book from this particular authorized version of the author. We have as well evidence among manuscripts and among the Cairo Beniza uh, of uh, paying patrons, bibliophiles, who uh, created, made, who made create wonderful books, like the most famous biblical codex, the Leningrad Codex of the entire Bible, which was created by Samuel ben Jacob in Fustat. We have five different dates in this manuscript, which correspond roughly to 1008 and 9. Today, the manuscript is in St. Petersburg in Fyukovich collection. The manuscript as the one of the eight colophons in the manuscript that you can see here, as the colophon explains, the manuscript was made, was copied <coughs> for Mevorach ben Cohen ben Joseph, who is also known as Ibn Yazdad. We know very well Mevorach and we know as well his father Joseph. These were Karaite merchants, very prominent members of the community in Fustat. We find in the Cairo Geniza several documents, legal documents, which concern this, this family. The grandfather was called Natanael, uh, and he probably hailed from Persia. He was an Iranian Karaite because the family name Ibn Yazdad, the word Yazdad mean, means God gives in Persian, which is an exact translation of the name Natanael. So we have indeed very known very well-known patrons who command the book uh, and, and employed a remarkable calligrapher. Very often, books were created for a specific patron, but later donated to the synagogue. We have no evidence that synagogues ordered books to be copied for the use of the synagogue. The initiative was private. It was always a private donor, a private patron who paid for a book, but very often these books were kept in the synagogue and we have specific, specific inscriptions in the books, dedicatory inscriptions or hagdashot, which say that this book was dedicated to a synagogue. Lo imaker ve lo igael. It cannot be sold, it cannot be redeemed. Like the Muslim waqf, dedication to a pious institution, it was an inalienable donation which had to be used for public purposes. In addition to these different ways of producing books, so or, or either do it yourself or a wonderful freelance artist, there were as well scribes who were employed in workshops. The workshops were held by people who were called warrak, warrakun, the word comes from the weight paper, like in French papetier. They were stationers, people who were in charge of all kinds of business, commercial, and other activities related to book production. Uh, in the 10th century, there is the growth of the professionalization of the book professions and production in this textualized Islamic world. Ibn Khaldun in his Muqaddimah, and this is an image from one of the manuscripts of Muqaddimah, which shows a library and people reading books, talks about the profession of Warak. He talks about the emergence of the profession, which consists of the copying, correcting, binding, and all other things related to books and office wear. It is linked to the development of cities and exists in the large cities with the advanced culture. So this is the Muslims but also among the Jews, there are professionals which deal with all kinds of bookish problems. We have, for instance, a Warak's day book, a notebook where he writes all his expenses and jobs that he has to do in the Bodleian Library. Again, a Geniza document. We have as well some of the Warakun, very famous ones like, um, uh, like Joseph Rosh Haseder, we have in the Cairo Geniza over 250 fragments written in his characteristic hand. 
he worked in Egypt, but he, he, he came from Iraq. So he was an Iraqi who settled in Egypt. He was a contemporary, younger contemporary of uh, Maimonides, so the turn of the 12th and the 13th century. He copied books, sold books, but he was also an author. He wrote uh, Talmudic commentaries himself. So he could be also a warak, could be an author, but he could be a student a businessman, an entrepreneur who employs other people. So we have very interesting documents which list not only books, but also jobs which were given to specific scribes, like this fragment still from the Cairo Geniza, which is a record of a warak in the British Library. You have the shelf mark Oriental 10656. On two sides of this book, we see parts of the same dictionary, which is Kitab al-Istirna of Shmuel Hanagid, the great uh, political man and author of the uh, 11th century uh, Spain, early 11th century Spain. Uh, we have six different scribes. Five of them were employed at the same time to copy the same two different copies of Kitab al-Istirna. Each one of them was receiving parts of the book of the, of the master copy, which was owned by the Warak, he was making a note here, which part of his book, which was not bound as a book, but, but kept in separate choirs, which part of the book was given to each scribe to copy. Like that, at the same time, five scribes worked on different part, parts of the same book. So it was a much quicker way, like a medieval university specchia to create a book. They, at the same time, they worked on prayer books and Talmudic copies. So all this we have in this very interesting, although not very beautiful and, uh, and difficult to read manuscript. We know as well that this particular book merchant was selling books, was working in Egypt, but sending books to Cordoba, to Spain, because this is what he says here. Uh, sent to Cordoba in total, and total, he writes Jumla in Arabic characters, Lamet Kutub, 30 books. So we have really professionalization of book trade and also book production by scribes who are employed by, by this entrepreneur. There are as well scribes who wrote books, but we know them as well from legal documents. This is the case of, for instance, of Paltiel Ben Ephraim, he died in 1011, and he's very famous because, well, first of all, he was, he was a scribe of legal documents of the Beit Din of Shemaria ben Elhanan at the end of the 10th and very beginning of the 13th century. Several documents, like this long deed of sale, um, were preserved, written by his characteristic, very calligraphic hand. Uh, his death is recorded in an important work found in the Cairo Geniza, which is called Megillat Mitzrayim, the scroll of Egypt, which describes the persecution of the Jews during the reign of Caliph al-Hakim. And apparently this persecution started during the burial, the funeral of Paltiel ben Ephraim himself. So he has, this, he has this famous history attached to him and he's mentioned as well in this historical chronicle Megillat Mitzrayim. We know through the analysis, paleographical analysis of his hand, that he was um, that he was able to write legal documents, but also uh, but also books like here, prayer books, which were discovered and identified through the characteristic handwriting. So he was also an owner of a library of a library because we find books written by different scribes, but with an ex libris decorated with letters and uh, different words of Paltiel ben Ephraim Haver. So there was this, and this is what Miriam Frankel says about the, this world of Warakun and the production of the books in the, um, in the medieval Pustat, that these were people who were readers, book producers, bookmakers, and also book collectors at the same time. So they, these were, they were extremely multi-functional uh, um, people. We have as well 
this importance of correcting books, especially if the books were created in the framework of a, uh, of a workshop. There is always the warak, the head of the workshop, who will go after the scribes he employed and he would correct the, the version according to a specific book that he has in his possession. I have given you here an example of manuscript Huntington 200 from uh, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, where every choir which had been corrected, that you can see here, contains just in the corner and written with a very, very faint script, the word muga, which means it has been corrected. So each time a part of the book was corrected, the proofreader would just write the word correct to make sure that it happens. And we have, we could multiply the evidence, but I have brought here a very interesting text, which comes from, which was written within on the first folio of manuscript Huntington uh, 80, which contains uh, the work of Maimonides and which was corrected itself by Maimonides himself or from Maimonides' book, because we have here, you have it here, uh, the inscription by Maimonides' own hand, Hugami Sifri Ani Moshe Barabi Maimon Tichonot Tzadik Livraha. It was corrected from my book, I, Moses, son of Rabbi Maimon, may his memory be blessed. So we have as well, by a different hand, an inscription, which is a record of bequest by a certain Abra Abraham, who was probably uh, Maimonides' disciple. And in this document, I quote, this book will never be a property of one man, but it will be readily available to all the students in order to correct the books from it, not to constantly read it or make new copies from it, but everyone who wishes to correct his book will be able to borrow a fascicle he wants from the Beit Din, leaving a warranty deposit equal to its value at the Beit Din until he finishes his proofreading and returns it. So we have an entire mechanism of the possibility of an institution, communal institution, keeping books and people who will be able to borrow parts of them. So the books would not be bound. They would be part of the book borrowed by people, they will be able to correct their own copies from it, and they will leave a payment, a certain amount of money, a deposit, a guarantee, before, uh, until they return the book with the institution. So as you can see, both copying and proofreading, controlling the quality of the books that are transmitted is extremely well organized in our world. So we don't have much time. I don't know how much time we have, but uh, uh, it is also important to ask ourselves how the scribes were trained. We have in the Cairo Geniza hundreds of fragments of children exercises in both Hebrew, like this children, famous children primer with the alphabet, Hebrew alphabet. We have as well passages that children copied. We have properly written passage probably by the teacher, and then Bereshit Bara Elohim, Genesis 1, uh, less well, but still very nicely copied by someone who is training how to, how to do it. Uh, we have as well exercises in Hebrew alphabet and Arabic alphabet. In the same manuscript, as you can see in the same fragment, you have the shelf mark here, which means that the same person trains to write and read in, the, in both Hebrew and Arabic. And by the way, Arabic to me looks a little bit uh, more professional and, uh, and better than Hebrew. Of course, the practice makes perfect. Once a scribe is already a professional scribe, it doesn't mean that he has to stop learning. In order to become a calligrapher, he will make copies from famous, from the books of famous uh, scribes. For instance, Samuel ben Jacob, the scribe of the Leningrad Codex that we have just seen, which was written in Fustat in 1008 or 9, was used 200 years later as a model 
for another wonderful scribe from the time of Maimonides, whose name was Solomon Halevi ben Samuel the Judge, Hadayan. We have here an exercise he copies from the beginning of a colophon of a book copied by Shmuel ben Yaakov. Ani Shmuel ben Yaakov katavti ben akatti umasavti. I, Samuel ben Jacob, I wrote the consonants, added the vowels and the masora. And here it stops. It's not a text. It is a training of the text. We know that it was not written by uh, Shmuel ben Yaakov for paleographical reasons, but also because we have the name of the other scribe on the, on the verso of the same leaf, Shlomo Halevi ben Rabbi Shmuel Hadayan, but we also have many other books that he copied. You have here an example, so we can compare his handwriting and we see that he was indeed he lived 200 years after the model of the wonderful classic calligrapher that he used. So the scribes needed different skills and they needed different levels of specialization. There were scribes writing books for every occasion and there were artists calligraphers. We have here from the Cairo Geniza a contract of employment which was published by Ben Outway recently. It is a, a, a a contract of employment of Samuel ben Jacob, who is exactly, precisely the scribe of Leningrad Codex and many other manuscripts which have been preserved. It was written in 1022 in Fustat, and it, it explains that the scribe is going not only to copy the consonantal text, the vowels, the masora, but also to take care of inscriptions within the book, probably the decoration, and also the book binding. So the same scribe have different jobs, but we have as well colophons, the inscriptions in books, where different scribes wrote consonantal text of the Bible and different added the masra and the vowels. So before the copy begins, when we already have the scribe who knows what he's doing, he's well-trained, he's a calligrapher, what is happening? He has to select the, mat the materials wisely different materials for different, different types of books. A Torah scroll is written on leather or parchment, never on paper. He needs to get good quality ink. And in the Cairo Geniza, we have many mentions of where good quality ink can be bought, how important it is, and also some recipes, how to make your own, own ink. He has to choose the model of the book, from what copy he's going to copy his own book. He has to make a plan of his page layout, choose the style of script, also according to the function of the book. He has to try his ink and pen to see whether he can finally start to put ink on parchment. Parchment is very expensive. You are not going to write before you are completely. There are different materials found in the Cairo Geniza. Papyrus, only one manuscript on papyrus, leather, parchment, and paper, which from the 11th century is the most frequent way of writing. The parchment or paper has to be prepared. Very often it is scored with lines, which are traced with a metal point in order to guide the scribe to make sure that his lines are straight. So he has to, before writing, he has to plan his page. On paper, it's done even quicker with a ruling board, which is made with cardboard. We have two examples from the Cairo Geniza. Uh, card cardboard with, um, with threads, which are made of vegetal material. You put your page of paper, you press on it, and it gives you furrows like this one, which just like scoring with a metal point, uh, will guide your writing without destroying the paper, which is much more fragile than parchment. Finally, what would you do if your, if your uh, plan is complicated, like the carpet pages with micrography design? You see, this is a geometrical design, which is uh, placed in geometrical shapes. You need to follow a specific model. You have to make your plans. For instance, when you have a model and you copy your book, you will try to keep precisely your page identical to the page which is your model. 
For instance, if you copy it a little bit more narrow and you put more text on a page, and if you don't want that your text does not correspond to the next text, I'm sorry, I think that there are conversations that, oh yes, there are questions, but I will answer them maybe, maybe later. So, so you have here an example of, uh, of Aleppo Codex, where, um, where you can see that the scribe had too much space on the page, but didn't want to write the text which belongs to the next page. So he wrote lines of space fillers that you could see here, many of them, every second line at the end of the folio 205 verso, because he wants to keep the plan to this model. So the planning has, is very complicated. For instance, in the famous London Bible, British Library Manuscript Oriental 4445, the Masora is arranged in such a way that it gives out the name of the scribe, Nisi Ben Daniel Ishmorehu El, as an acrostic. So you have to plan very well your page in order to be able to put the acrostic. And it is even more complicated when you want to have a micrographic design. And we are very lucky because the Cairo Geniza has preserved some trials, some plans that the scribe made in order to create a page. Instead of using writing straight on good quality new parchment, scribes would reuse old pieces of manuscripts. Here it was a rotulus, a long text in a row, vertical row, with a, with a very early version of the commentary on Psalms from the, the end of the 10th century. On the other side, dozens of years later, a scribe used this old manuscript because the verso was available, there was nothing on it. So he used it to create a design for his page with biblical verses. We have other examples of this kind of uh, reuse of material, a little bit less finished, maybe more of a trial than a project of a, of a page. On a genealogical list of the 12th century, we have exercises in Arabic, and on the verso, we have as well a reuse. It looks like a cat with two ears, but actually, this is the training to create this geographic micrographical uh, design uh, to be able to, um, to create the books. So we have this very important manuscript which show us the scribe at work. How is he working? He has to choose the script, specific mode of script, according to whether he wants to copy a Bible, a Talmud, a letter, a document. And we even have the scribe Joseph ben Jacob Rosh Haseder, whom I have already mentioned, who created, we, we have documents uh, written in his hand. In the margins, this is a list of books that he wants to sell. You remember he was a warak, he was a bookseller, or books he wants to copy. But here in the middle, this is a completely different text. If you look at it carefully, he's writing different fragments, passages of the text, sometimes the same text in different modes of Oriental script, very calligraphic square, calligraphic, but a book hand, more common, quicker, or here, very cursive, quick way of writing, and here again, biblical, but with vowels, as if he, as a scribe, both trained how to write in different modes of script, but maybe also because he wanted to show his patrons what are his possibilities, what kind of script he can actually make. And he can write in four different modes of script in addition to his very cursive notes that he used, he reused, he used on the reuse paper. So what it means now for the scribe is to try his pen, to try his ink, usually on old pieces of parchment, uh, a very important formula that the scribe write, writes either in Arabic or in Hebrew, lenasot dio la date dio fio to try the the ink or colmus calamus to try its beauty, and after the scribe has trained, 
he can finally only now begin to write. But I think that I have spoken for too long, so I'm going to stop here and I hope that you have appreciated how complicated and how wonderful the work of a medieval scribe was. Thank you very much. And I will try to go back. Thank you very oh. much. So you have actually heard me. I we, have. We, we've heard you very well. No, it was really interesting. And I had this impression that you have disappeared and that I was talking only to my screen. No, Did you... we, <laughs> we were following. Okay. Did you see my PowerPoint as well? Yes. Really Good. splendid, actually. Yes, indeed, with all these manuscripts. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for attention. And there are lots of questions already in the chat. So I will start with uh, Simon Landman. Who has two questions could one only borrow books if one was a scribe or could anyone borrow books second question to what extent were scribes specialized in a certain type of text and uh, were they required to have knowledge of the contents of the text right thank you very much simone so i think that that everyone could borrow books of course i cannot talk about every single synagogue and arrangement everyone everywhere else the hagdashot the uh, the dedicational dedication inscriptions have not yet been really studied as such we know about some of them because they have been found in very famous bible manuscripts but there are dozens of inscriptions which are ded dedications to specific institutions especially in firkovich collections in st petersburg which is one of the most important collection collections of Eastern, Oriental, Hebrew, and Judeo-Arabic manuscripts, they haven't really been studied as a corpus. However, we already know that, for instance, in the 11th century, there was an important school of Karaite scholars in Jerusalem, and many preserved books were dedicated to this particular uh, Karaite school. And we get an impression that, that all the members of the communities could consult the books maybe not necessarily borrow to take home, they could, they, but they could consult them. So houses of learning, um, yeshivot, um, batei midrash or synagogues or batei din, the tribunals, probably all these institutions were situated very closely together, together if not all of them in the synagogue and outbuildings. Uh, so we actually talk about the communal institutions. Um, so uh, probably people could actually just walk in, study there, it, they functioned like, like libraries, like public libraries. Although Malachi Betarie argues that there were not really public libraries as such in, a, in Jewish tradition, but I think that we have some, some evidence that the books indeed could be borrowed or could be studied, could be taken from the synagogue as well home. For instance, I have given you this example of the letter from the Bodleian Library of restoring the Bible, very important. Here, the writer of the letter clearly says that he has taken the Bible from the synagogue and the Bible is in the scribe's home because the scribe had to inspect the Bible first in order to know what has to be done. And he did it at home. So we don't know what was the context, but we have an impression that, that, that it was a public, public access, that, that, that the, the books, the idea was that books should be copied for people, that there should be as many books as possible, both copied, copied um, uh, commercially, but also in a private way. That was your first question. The second, so I don't think that it was only professional scribes, especially since professional scribe, is, it's a very tricky, uh, tricky way of saying it. Of course, when you're a freelance scribe, you can be considered professional scribe, but usually these scribes were school teachers or hazanim, so they had different profession at the same time unless they became wonderful calligraphers and they had so many orders that, you know, that, that, that they, they, well, it's very long to copy an entire Bible. It's almost a year. So when you calculate that the scribe can copy about two and a half folios of square text per day, and when you take away Shabbat and holidays and, and winter when there is no natural light, we are in the Middle Ages, there's no electricity. 
So all this has to be considered. It's about a year work to copy a Bible. So it's really a very, very important uh, task. So a professional scribe, well, do we have really people who earn only by writing books as we saw per day or pay, per page, it was very, it was a very low, uh, low payment. And then your second question was, was being specialized. So I think that some, some of the scribes specialized indeed. So we have people who are, who are famous scribes, calligraphers. When you are a calligrapher, you will probably earn money copying Bibles. You, when you are a Bible calligrapher, you can be at the same time a Masoretic, a specialist of the, uh, of the vocalization and Masoretic tradition. For that, you, you normally need to know what you are writing. And then sometimes the same person would be the proofreader, corrector. This is the case of, um, of Shmuel ben Jacob. He was doing all these jobs by himself. So he clearly knows what he's writing. We do have scribes who know less. Uh, however, the rule is that when you are a calligrapher, you actually focus on the form of your letters, on the beauty of the script. So most uh, mechanical mistakes are actually done by the scribes who are extremely professional calligraphers. When you write for yourself in not a very decorative script, you, might make, you, you may make mistakes, of course, because you may not be careful, but you usually know what you, what you are writing. And um, it doesn't mean that you, you don't make mistakes. All the scribes, all human beings make mistakes. So it depends very much on, on, on an individual person. So I think that your question, whether there is a division of labor, there is and there isn't. So there are people who are able to do everything. There are people who specialize in producing specific books and there are people writing books for themselves. And uh, we have as well with, again, going back to Shmuel ben Jacob, we have his calligraphic Bible, but we have as well less calligraphic writings, which probably can be attributed to him, although there is uh, not clear evidence, no colophon that it was him, but, but uh, I, we have no time to go into details, but probably he can write in different styles and he can copy. So the books that we have, we have, we have seven different Bibles. Uh, Ronnie Folland was here, he discovered one of the uh, manuscripts, which was copied by, in the Cairo Geniza, a fragment, just a page, which was copied by Shmuel ben Yaakov. It is a Hebrew Bible with the tafsir, with, with the Arabic translation. So Ronnie is here, so he discovered it. So for the time being, we know about seven books or fragments of books copied by Shmuel ben Yaakov, but the corpus is growing. There are new discoveries in the Cairo Geniza. And um, um, Mordechai Akiva Friedman discovered as well two uh, fragments of, of, a, uh, of a prayer book that he argues, and I think he's right, that they were copied by uh, Shmuel ben Yaakov. So indeed, there was both Bibles, calligraphic Bibles like the Muslim uh, Mashaf. So it would be, by the way, the Hebrew calligraphic Bible is called a Mitzhaf as well just like a, like, like a Quran. So a calligrapher would make this, this piece of art, but the same person was able to write in different styles, less decorative, less calligraphic, and it would be employed for other books. So I think that there was not a very clear uh, specialization, although there are some people who specialized in vowels, in vocalization. So I think that we have to go case by case in order to sort it out, but on the whole, many people were able to do lots of things as far as books were concerned. Thank you, Judith. Uh, Jonathan Katz is asking if there is a Cairo hand that differs from other scribal styles. Uh, it is, a, yeah, it is a, an excellent and very difficult question. Uh, we do have manuscripts which do not come from the Cairo Geniza. And we have uh, several projects, and uh, I, I already quoted Ronnie Folland and, uh, and uh, Blanca Biruendas and Fabio Iopoli, who we, we are involved together in the study, paleographical study of the Oriental manuscripts up to the 13th century. So I hope I will be able to answer your question much, much better in three years' time. For the time being, I might tell you that when I look at the fragment, 
I'm able to tell you, yes, this is an Egyptian fragment when I think it's Egyptian, but I usually do it because I know the scribe or I recognize the scribe that I have already seen. I hope that at some point we'll be able to give a scientific paleographical answer to say these are specific features which are characteristic of Egyptian manuscripts. Mm, actually, uh, Shmuel Benyakov and the Leningrad Codex again, he writes in Egypt. Uh, he, uh, if, if the identification of Ben Outwait, of this Shmuel Ben Yaakov, with a writer of a letter that he published is uh, correct, that means that Shmuel Ben Yaakov did not come from Egypt. He comes from somewhere else, we don't know where from. The script that he uses in his wonderful calligraphic manuscripts is the script that was developed in Iraq, in Abbasid Iraq. It is a, 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 a Babylonian type of calligraphy. However, calligraphy, the Muslim Arabic calligraphy developed in Baghdad or in Iraq, and Jewish calligraphy too, and then it spread to other communities. So, so the fact that he uses the Babylonian style of Abbasid Hebrew calligraphy doesn't mean that he comes from Iraq because at his time, end of the 10th, very beginning of the 11th century, this kind of originally Iraqi or Iranian, Babylonian style already spread in communities in North uh, and Egypt. So it's very difficult to, to make sure what are the specific elements which will tell us that this manuscript is Egyptian. So I feel that I can do it as a trained paleographer, but for the time being, I am unable to say, yes, this is Egyptian because. So until I know, you shouldn't believe me. This is why I will answer your question in three years time. We will know better because we will study very specific groups of manuscripts dated and undated from the Cairo Geniza and compare it with manuscripts from other collections, which do not necessarily come from the Cairo Geniza, might have been written in Syria or Iraq. So we need to do this more uh, localized work by specific groups of manuscripts, by smaller entities that just Oriental, which is not enough. Thank but you. for the time being, yes, you can say the manuscript is Egyptian, but as a paleographer, I cannot really tell you why. <laughs> so let's. <laughs> I ask you again in three years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Exactly. Please do. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. A question from uh, Anthony Davis about the, the specialization. So in the example you finished with on the scribe who also bound the books, was it typical of this period? And Anthony is uh, commenting on the fact that it's a contrast to the European tradition, which by the early 16th century had evolved a specialist craft of book binding, conferring advantages of efficiency and cost. Yes. Yes, book binding is a wonderful, wonderful subject. So first of all, I should mention that we have no one single manuscript from earlier part of the Middle Ages up to the 15th century, actually, Hebrew manuscript in its original book binding. So the Leningrad Codex has a book binding. Well, it's detached now, but it's, uh, but it's preserved together, but it is a it is a North African book binding from the early modern period. And we have as well, um, we, we have as well the, the Kenicott Bible, which was created in La Coruña in Spain, which does have the original binding, but this is the end of the 15th century. From the Middle Ages, none of the full manuscripts contains, does have the original binding. But we know that books, some books were bound, the others were not. And for that, we have the book lists from the Cairo Geniza, and also we have pieces of binding, actually, which were preserved in the, in the Cairo Geniza, but with, without the books. So we have pieces, you know, just, just, uh, just letter bindings. So, however, for your question, we know that in the Cairo Geniza books, in the Cairo Geniza world, books could be sold and kept, bound or unbound. And book lists from the Cairo Geniza will give us descriptions of the bindings saying 
this is a leather red binding, and this one is yellow, and this is this, and this is that. So the cost of the book will be, of course, higher if the book contains binding, and sometimes the bindings are indeed precious, and they are decorated, and so on and so forth. So we have descriptions, but we have lots of descriptions of books which are kept and sold unbound. And a book which is unbound, it's very important because if you are a warak, a book seller and bookmaker, obviously you will try to keep the books unbound if these are the models that you will use for copying. It's very difficult to copy a book from a bound copy. It's, you know, you have to keep it open. It's very difficult, especially if it is parchment, you know, it goes back to, to its natural animal shape. So when you, when you, when you work on, on parchment manuscripts and you turn the pages, you see how difficult it is sometimes to turn them. So it is much easier to copy your book when it is unbound. And the professionals of writing, the warakun, we know that they kept books unbound so that, and this is the new discovery, that I actually made, that they could give these separate parts of the same work to different scribes. For the, you are, you are talking about the Western, Western world. We have this famous quotation from, uh, from Sefer Hasidim, from the book of the, of, of, uh, of the pious, uh, from the, the end of the 12th century, Judah the pious from, from, from Rhine region, where uh, they say, in our world, the Talmud is normally bound every order by order, seder by seder. Unlike the Oriental communities, where the Talmud is transmitted masechet by masechet, tractate by tractate. So they said, Sefer Hasidim says, we do the contrary. We put all the seder in all the tractates from one seder in one book, because if you want to bring the book to, to Beit Midrash, to the school, to study, you might want to refer to other parts of the same tractate. You are not going to carry all these, all these books with you. So we do it in one volume, seder by seder. But then the Sefer Hasidim adds, unless you have books to lend them, le hashil, because if you lend them for which means probably to lend them by copy. Because if you lend an entire tractate, you block your book as a model for a long time. Whereas when you have smaller fascicles, you can lend one to someone and another one to someone else. So this is like the medieval tekia system that we saw in the Orient. And Sefer Hasidim is actually talking about it as well. That means that you can, if you have the book, you know, in smaller in, in smaller sections, you can just, you know, you can use different sections at the same time by different people. Which, and, and then Sefer Hasidim says a very important sentence. It is to encourage spreading the books, copying the books, there'll be more books, okay? So there was this clear idea of making the copying as efficient as possible. So I think that the medieval world is very, you know, the binding is, is extremely important, but I think that very often the books circulated unbound and there was a reason to, for that because it was easier to copy them and quicker to copy them. I don't know that I have answered. I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Judith. Um, Helen, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Well, thank you very much, Claire. Um, yeah, can I, can I just start by saying thank you so much for such a, a wonderful lecture. I, I, I wrote in the chat, you've just given us such a sort of rich insight into scribal culture. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, I, I was particularly um, interested when you were talking about how anyone might be a scribe. And uh, you mentioned that the evidence for female scribes is, is difficult. Um, but I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. I, I found that really interesting. Right, yes, yes, thank you very much. So first of all, we don't have books with colophons from the Cairo Geniza world written by scribes that we know 100% that it was written, written by a woman. We, we do know from Yemen, from the, from the 16th century, there was a scribe, Miriam, in the famous family of Benayahu, 
There was the father, two brothers, and Miriam, who copied books. There was in Germany before the Second World War a book copied by her, where she was apologizing for shortcomings because she was she was feeding a baby when she was copying her book. So it's very interesting. It's 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 wonderful, but this book disappeared during Second World War, so we don't have it anymore. But we have publications about it. So this is from the Oriental community. This is what we have. We, of course, have from Italy the example of Paola, wonderful scribe who, who copied not only not only prayer books, which was which which would, you would expect it from a woman, but also she copied uh, today in in the in the Bodleian Library the commentary of Isaac of Trani, the the. Uh, the, the commentary on the Babylonian Talmud, which is a tough work, I would say, but she copied it very beautifully. So we have this scribe and we have as well a little bit later, Hannah. So she copied in the 90s of the 13th century and we have as well a little bit later, Hannah from Cologne. So we do have female scribes, no problem about it. And why not, actually? So in the Cairo Geniza, we don't have any colophon or anything which says that, that the woman copied the book. We have women who ordered books. So this we have, women who were patrons, women who dedicated books to synagogues, this we have. So in the 11th century, 12th century, we have evidence of women who ordered books. And we have as well women who, we have this famous story about Mu'allima, a woman who was a teacher of, of, for, for children. And we have some letters which were written by women. The problem is that we never know or rarely know whether whether it was written by her in her own hand or whether she hired someone. I have mentioned the story of Miriam, the uh, sister of Maimonides, who wrote indeed a letter to Maimonides. Uh, the letter must have been written before 1169 because she sends greetings to David, uh, Maimonides' brother. Uh, we know that he died, he, he drowned at, at sea trying to cross to India. Uh, in 1169. So the letter must have been written before that. It talks about her son. She, she, she's very upset because her son left without, without any warning, without leaving traces, without any communication, without writing, writing letters to, to his mother. And she suspects strongly that Maimonides knows where he is. This is another very beautiful story that we could talk for hours, but it's a very touching letter, very beautiful letter of a woman. But here we know that she didn't write it. So at the end, she, the, the, she dictates the, the, the letter, but, uh, but there is the name of the Hazan. She asked the Hazan, someone, to write the letter for her, and his name is mentioned. So in this case, we know that although it's a personal letter, uh, it was written by someone else. And also for reading letters, we have this evidence that when the you know that there was for the letters, private letters, there was this wonderful system in the Geniza world, in the Oriental world, both of official barid, of official post office of the Muslims, but also merchants had their own, um, they own couriers, you know, kind of kind of Amazon or DHL to, to bring the letters in addition to the official royal mail. And, uh, and uh, we have lots of evidence of that from the Cairo Geniza. And we know as well that when uh, we have some beautiful letters when uh, when the courier was coming to Fustat, all the family was coming, the, all the women were coming, and he was reading the letter from the brother or father or husband. It was a public reading. She would not read herself. The bearer of the letter would just probably for a small payment would read what is in the letter. So we have letters that talk about it. A sister tells to write to her brother, probably someone writes for her. I ran when I heard that, that the courier came with your letter and he read this letter. I was there, I listened to it and you didn't send greetings for me. So, you know, so this is a public event, reading of a family letter. So, you know, there were women probably who knew how to read and write, but even Maimonides' sister wouldn't write by herself. And she was married to one of the most important Jewish courtiers who was a courtier of the... Uh, of the of the caliphal court, so she was probably a very uh, a, a very educated or at least uh, well uh, sister of Maimonides and the wife of a of a very uh, very educated uh, clerk, and she dictated her letter. It's very difficult to to know really 
what the women were readers and uh, well, some were this we know, but maybe not, not many of them. This is why I use this masculine pronoun all the time, because I actually mostly talk about men. Thank you very much. That was a really rich answer as well. Really, really good. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, we've come to the end. I think, does Sarah want to say something to conclude or? Um, sorry, just trying to find the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, just to say, wow, and um, thank you so much to, to Judith uh, for sharing the vast riches of her knowledge uh, and expertise with us this evening and for bringing alive the world of the Cairo Geniza of the past and also what it can mean today in terms of the questions it, it poses to us. Um, absolutely wonderful and I hope you did that you see from the enthusiasm uh, with which your lecture has been received how much we appreciate what you have given us this evening and it just remains to say thank you very very much indeed it's been a real privilege uh, to hear from you thank you i thank you very much thank you for your attention i, I was really honored to to participate in this series of lectures thank you very much thank you thank you bye thank you so much judith it was a pleasure thank really and uh a privilege to listen to you. So thank you on behalf of the Parks Institute and the Center for Medieval and Re Renaissance Culture. I've put in the chat the link to our, uh, the sign up for our mailing list and also information on our forthcoming events. So then at the next lecture will be the Montefiore lecture in uh, two weeks delivered by Joachim Schler. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you, Claire. Thank you.